should have asked this earlier, but is it possible to, uh, you know, oh, sure. since we all have wonderful pictures. Yeah, it's a little bit quicker right here. I mean, to make the lights dark. Oh, yeah, to so darken. Yeah. Yep, I will see what we can do. The light switches are in the back corner. Right there, thank you. All right. Thank you all for being here. I reiterate the thanks. Thanks to Andrew uh, for organizing and inviting and supporting us. And thanks to Erica for making the connection with me in particular. Um, to Lydia, to Libby, and, and to all these. And thank you also to Michael uh, Gaudio and Dave Well Jeffrey for our conversation. Today I'm excited about it. And last but not least, to my art history students who are here in attendance. <laughs> Enjoyed our time together. Here we go. Word and image. This little phrase is ubiquitous in medieval art history. Though useful and at times necessary, this phrase can do violence to our ability to understand these two medieval forms of expression by juxtaposing and thus distancing word from image. While this clear-cut distinction might reflect modern sensibilities, <coughs> the medieval reality was much more complicated. In his essay, Script as Image, Jeffrey Hamburger explores what he refers to as the iconicity of script. That is, the ability of the written word to bear meaning, even apart from the content it signifies as an assemblage of letters. <coughs> Conversely, medieval images were themselves a kind of text to be read, an understanding famously articulated by Pope Gregory the Great in the sixth century when he wrote, for a picture is displayed in churches on this account, in order that those who do not know letters may at least read by seeing on the walls what they are unable to read in books. This statement not only legitimized the use of religious images as books for the literate, but also reinforced and has since been used to perpetuate a hierarchy in which images are subjected to words, deriving value from their ability to illustrate a text. In short, the relationship between word and image in the Middle Ages was not dichotomous, but dynamic, as images were used to form words and vice versa. <coughs> Letters and words, really. Moreover, while many images did indeed function like the written word, and as much as they presented a legible narrative, like in comic books, pictures were also capable of expressing and invoking what words could not. It was this multivalent iconic power that contributed to the iconoclastic controversies of the 8th and 9th century. This afternoon, I will explore one such example of the dynamic <coughs> relationship between word and image found in the Ashburnham Pentateuch. Also referred to as the Pentateuch of Tours, the Ashburnham Pentateuch is a late 6th century manuscript of unknown origin, most recently hypothesized as being Roman. The physical details and historical context of this particular alteration, in which the image of a caption image pair was obliterated, leaving only text behind, reveal the medieval trust in and preference for the written word over and against the image. <clears throat> My own interest in the Ashburnham Pentateuch is rooted in what is visually uh, probably the least <laughs> impressive image. And I know this looks like a bunch of blobs, and <laughs> we're going to talk through it. It will be OK. <laughs> um, the modification that will be the focus of my talk is found in the first image of the manuscript, which illustrates the first three days of creation. In its original sixth century state, the miniature presented the father and son standing side by side four times with the Holy Spirit depicted only once uh, on the side of there as a winged man. In the ninth century, by which time the manuscript was housed at Tours in France, the Holy Spirit in the figure to the right of the extant creator were first erased, probably by scraping or washing, mm -hmm. and then painted over with green and pink paint. Leaving in, uh, excuse me, and then leaving in its modified state three father creators and one son creator. So, if that makes sense, the bottom pair are flipped, and so that changed what happened at the bottom. So we'll get that exactly. uh, and these erasures are visible on the or the original image is still visible on the back side of the image, so you can see that there were these pairs because of the discoloration of the halos. That's the sun. <coughs> and then there's this little. There you go. In his 50 year study of the Ashburnham Pentateuch, which began in the 1960s, Veselo Narquist observed three distinct hands in the original manuscript that of the scribe who wrote the main text, of the draftsman who did the brown ink underdrawings and captions and that of the colorist who painted the illustrations in gouache and then rewrote the captions. Um, and we can see some of this process because there was water damage to the manuscript <coughs> that revealed the layers. Of the Ashburnham Pentateuch's original 69 miniatures, only 19 survive, and I'm gonna do a really quick flash through all of them. 16 are full page, full page paintings, three are less than a full page. 
Their scenes are almost always arranged in registers, although the individual scenes are frequently presented out of sequential order. Therefore, the reader would need to be familiar enough with the biblical narrative to be able to reassemble the images, so to speak. Depicting scenes from the lives of Adam and Eve, Noah, Abraham, Joseph, and Moses, these miniatures are densely packed with men and women, animals, architectural settings, and descriptive inscriptions. There seems to have been a close working relationship between the scribe and the painter. And this can be seen in folios in which the text determined the size of the illustrations, as found, for example, in folio 127. Similarly, the use of inscriptions within the illustrations of the Ashford and Pentateuch demonstrates a cooperative organization. All 19 of the manuscripts extant images include inscriptions, which are written in an uncial script in either brown or white ink. As mentioned, the draftsman included identifying uh, captions along with his underdrawings. These captions are based on the text of the um, Vetus Latina, which is a, a pre-Vulgate text, and then also the Vulgate version of the Bible, although they only quote directly from these sources occasionally. The captions were then retraced by the colorist who also painted the images. However, there are some instances in which the captions and images do not perfectly correspond, revealing a kind of disagreement between the creators of the manuscript. For example, in the scene of Lot sleeping with his daughters, pictured here, the caption reads, Lot, we're drunk, he slept with his daughters. But the image portrays Lot seated on a chair near a mattress, that's the big white blob on the bottom, um, accepting a chalice from one of his daughters. That is, thanks to the text of the inscription, the image is able to imply the rest of the story without having to portray uh, the distasteful bits. Some captions and images are outright contradictions, as for example in this image of Noah's sacrifice after exiting the ark. While the caption reflects the biblical account, describes Noah making an animal sacrifice, the image instead presents a very Eucharistic scene in which Noah is apparently blessing the chalice, and Noah's hand really nicely is echoed by God's hand blessing above. On one hand, the inscription image relationship in the Ashburn and Pentateuch demonstrates a preference for the written word, and as much as the text gives the real or literal story, um, as in the example of Lot and his daughters. But on the other hand, the images have visual primacy over the text, and that the inscriptions are crammed to fit into these architectural spaces around the figures uh, inside doors and windows, and are never on top of the figure. And more significantly, the image are t images are tasked with interpreting and expanding upon the text to provide a spiritual uh, and allegorical reading, uh, as especially in this where there's the Eucharistic interpretation that's not present in the text. And here I mean spiritual in the sense of the four senses of scripture, right? So we get the historical version, the literal version, and these bottom three are uh, the spiritual category. Won't get into that. So having done a rip roaring ride through these elements, <laughs> real quick. Um, the relationship between the script and the captions and the images throughout the Ashburn and Pentateuch, we can now get back uh, to the erasures. As mentioned at the outset, the redactor erased and painted over the figures of three sons, one father, and the Holy Spirit. These modifications were rendered in paint that carefully matched the background, so it was intended to hide the change, right? conceal it as best as possible. To speak more generally, while the precise date and context of changes made to manuscripts remain unknown to the modern viewer, the method of alteration can provide some clues as to the redactor's intention. Corrective acts against manuscripts are not uncommon, especially in the late Middle Ages and early modern period. These can include effacement by uh, scratching, rubbing, or kissing, excision, or overpainting. The majority of such acts consist of the physical removal or obliteration of the image from the page, presumably by the reader and or owner. Regarding such alterations made to medieval manuscripts, Michael Camille once suggested that, quote, we must examine such cases not so much as acts of vandalism, but as acts of representation. We tend to associate creation with the construction, not destruction, but the selective, selective obliteration of parts of an image surely constitutes not merely editing and expurgation as with the text, but also uh, an embodied response. So this by reading the combination of the method of alteration, the target of the alteration, and then the remaining image, we are able to interpret such acts as creative assertions, right? a new thesis. So a sense of propriety, for example, may lead to the erasure of the offending appendages of lewd marginal figures, as here in the Roman de la Rose, or uh, sinful characters, as these copulating couples who have been removed from the Stuttgart Psalter. Uh, meanwhile, more spiritually threatening images, such as depictions of Satan or demons, uh, tend to have their faces or eyes scratched out. It's 
a kind of performative of individual piety, a personal response to an image um, that was most likely committed at a time when the manuscript was still being a used object. Right? This isn't something that's going to happen in the library, probably. <laughs> Such aggr aggressive actions hint at a materialistic connection between the image and the reader. There is no attempt here to conceal this category of erasure. Instead, the removal of such images creates an intentionally visible lacuna on the page. It's the whole point that now there's a, there's a gap there. Meanwhile, the narrative miniatures, portraits of divinity, or illuminated initials often cut out of manuscripts were likely removed by collectors. This was especially the case during periods in which religious manuscripts were no longer used devotionally and began in earnest in the 18th century. Um, when objects had become, you know, of points of historical curiosity. Um, and we have some really nice examples at Himmel um, in Collegeville. This is a 19th century scrapbook, which is fun and sad at the same time. Um, and the, it, these things could be reused in the Middle Ages, actually. Some medieval people would do this. But. Obliteration by painting, on the other hand, is considerably less common. And of course, it's also more difficult uh, to detect if it's successful. For example, inscriptions or coats of arms are often adapted to reflect new ownership of a manuscript, as here at the bottom of the page, in which the coat of arms is just uh, completely painted over. So, comparatively, the Ashburn and Pentateuch's erasures are unique on account of the combined method, erasure and overpainting, and target of the Son and the Holy Spirit uh, of their destruction, which together creates a new statement concerning the presence of God at creation. Because it lacks the impassioned character of erasures and scratchings, which are motivated more by devotion than doctrine, the carefully executed alterations of the Ashburn and Pentateuch's creation page should not be regarded as an iconoclastic act, but as a thoughtful gesture of theological correction. So, what argument can we read, then, in the erasure and overpainting of this page? In addition to the three fathers and one son, the inscriptions of the page remain, though some are difficult to read on account of the water damage. And so here I have to rely on uh, Bezalel Narquise's account. He was able to view it under ultraviolet light in the 1960s, which is something that the Bibliotheque Nationale does not uh, allow us anymore. So we're going to start in the upper left-hand uh, corner and, and try and move quickly through just so you can get a, a sense. So you can see a little bit of the uh, underdrawing there that's been washed away. So this is the underscript that would have been covered over by paint. This is here's where the Lord created heaven and earth. Um, and then above, this is the official or end uh, caption. Here's where the Lord created the earth. Um, and here's the earth. <laughs> you didn't know. Publicly labeled earth. <laughs> and here's, here's heaven right there with uh, seven blue and purple bands. And moving along to the right is the creation um, of <coughs> light and shadows. So the big uh, orange square here, it would have been much more vibrant before it uh, suffered water damage. And we can also, quick note, uh, identify this as the father because he has a beard and the son is not uh, bearded. So then directly below, uh, after the creation, these the light and darkness are now separated. Which is where the Lord separates or divides them. And now moving back to the left middle of the page, so up here is where the Holy Spirit was covered over. Um, the water of the Holy Spirit does double duty here. Um, and is the separation of the waters from the waters. So this is the creator doing that action. And then the bottom register of the page is the separation of the dry land from the, from the waters. So this is the creator doing that action. This is the instance where they've flipped places because they're, <coughs> if you haven't noticed, in exactly the same pose being traced. Um, and here is our land separated uh, from waters in heaven. I like that we have the same rectangle that just gets built in. Um, and then the where the sea is separating uh, from the dry land in the mountains. So, real, real quick there. Of the folios erasures, the one that I find most interesting in regards to the relationship between image and text is the one done to the Holy Spirit. Whereas the other erasures of this folio leave a figure behind to perform a the action, the illustration of Genesis 1-2, and that is the spirit hovering over the waters, has been rendered visually subjectless. There's no one there performing that action. There's no one there uh, illustrating that. Um, his body, which hovered head down, was covered in green and pink paint. The inscription was left intact. Um, it reads, here is the spirit of the Lord where he is hovering over the waters. And actually, when you, you, it's, when you see it in, in person, uh, the toes are 
really distinct. It's clear that there's some conversation, is it, a, is it as a dove or a man? It's definitely uh, toesies there. So, the effect of this erasure is ghostly, as the inscription containing the demonstrative heap is no longer accompanied by a figure, only a field of color. Or as Gertrude Stein might say, there's no here, here. The erasure overpainting is itself a negation of what was once depicted. Its coexistence with the adjacent inscription is reifying in spite of itself. That is, reading the inscription, here is the spirit of the Lord, one naturally asks, where? To which the answer is now nowhere, or everywhere. The erasure is thus an embodied response to the content of the page. By which I mean the erasure not only works to negate the divine figures it obliterates, but it also embodies a statement about those very figures. Additionally, the overpainting creates a new space, which is activated by the accompanying text. By leaving behind the inscription, here is the spirit of the Lord, the redactor has thus ascribed meaning, or at least allowed the possibility of meaning to be ascribed to the painting itself. This act of void is reminiscent of the similarly charged space between the cherubim of the mercy seat, this is also from the Ashburn Institute, uh, or Theodolf of Orleans' Apps Mosaic, Jeremy Dupre, the Carolingian work, as well as depictions of the Annunciation. Um, this is a 9th century, early 9th century uh, gospel book that use the empty negative architectural space between Gabriel and Mary to suggest the presence of the Holy Spirit. So there's no little homunculus man or, or dove here, um, but we get an empty space in which architecturally or liturgically is filled with the Holy Spirit. Whether or not the redactor intended such an inter interpretation, it is clear that they were not concerned about maintaining a consistency between the inscriptions and the images. As much as they were preoccupied with censoring this particular visual depiction of God, because this folio was the only target of erasure and the entire Ashburn and Pentateuch and other images of God remain untouched throughout the manuscript. And we have uh, Hand of God um, and this uh, kind of Friday looking Jesus is actually on Mount Sinai there. And the uh, Jacob's Ladder, um, so he's a cruciform inscribed halo. And then the um, plague of the firstborn there. The son is commanding the angel to kill the firstborn. So these, these other instances of divinity uh, that are very um, Jesus looking have not have not been touched. So we have to ask what is it about this particular image that uh, invited or caused erasure? Here in particular, the historical context comes into play. Basil Narkis hypothesized a ninth century date for the erasures of the creation folio based on the paint's resemblance to manuscripts that were being produced uh, at the Tour Scriptorium at the same time. For example, the Vivian Bible. Uh, based on the restorations in French Uncial script, and several, several folios. The manuscript was probably in France by the mid eighth century. And more specifically, based on the minuscule script of this folio, was in tour by the early ninth century. So if the Ashburn and Pentateuch was indeed in tour and was indeed modified in the early ninth century as Narcissus hypothesized, then we can infer some things about the context and possible motivations of the erasures. Several Christological and Trinitarian debates were being waged at this time, and I'm just gonna really briefly account for two. The Filioque controversy, uh, which was waged at this time, um, was both a theological and ecclesiological issue. It refers to the Western Church's insertion, well, clarification, or from the East perspective, uh, the insertion or addition of the Filioque phrase to the Nicene Creed. The West saw this articulation of the procession of the Holy Spirit from both the Father and the Son as necessary in preserving the unity of the Trinity. And they had already taught this concept for centuries. Um, some would date it back to Augustine by the time it was inserted into the Nicene Creed uh, in the churches of Spain and then in Gaul by the late 8th century. It was not officially inserted into creeds in Rome until the 11th century, um, which is the dates of the Great Schism, of course. A later Trinitarian debate that was raised by Gottschalk of Orbe uh, and his term Trina Deitas, in which he used to emphasize the Trinity's three in oneness. So it's kind of a term that means like triple deity. Um, and he was trying to articulate that only the second person of the Trinity assumed a human nature in the incarnation. So he wanted to preserve the individual identities of the three persons of the Trinity, um, which does sound a bit like modalism. Um, his opponents, who include Hinkmar of Rheem, vehemently disagreed with this use uh, of Trina Deitas, countering that it was not only inconsistent with the received writings of the Church Fathers, uh, but was also unbiblical and unavoidably tritheistic or polytheistic, basically, because it ascribed a distinct deity to each person, right? 
The concern for the unity of the Trinity is that reflected, I argue, uh, iconographically in Carolingian depictions of creation, which only ever present the Logos or the Son as the creator. So here's the Mutia Grenville Bible. So here's the Son. Um, these are personifications of the days of creation, and I have a question and answer. I could explain that more if you don't buy it. Um, the Vivian Bible. Uh, in the Stuttgart Bible, I mean the Stuttgart Psalter, excuse me. The Ashburn and Pentateuch's erasures conform to the image of the, uh, to the image, to the expectations of the period, and so it seems the redactor was more concerned with presenting a single creator uh, than who they erased, right? So we have this inconsistency between the persons they erased. Another possibility is that the redactor was actually trying to erase the father, but was accustomed to depictions of Christ being at the right hand of the father, um, and then would erase the figure to uh, our right, their left, anyway. Um, the scene of the Holy Spirit, while all of these uh, other figures have a label and have someone performing the action, the scene of the Holy Spirit is the only one that is left, right? As I said, subjectless. We might interpret this as part of the redactor's program to emphasize the unity of the Trinity. <laughs> Also significant in understanding Carolingian image theory is their response to the iconoclastic controversy that was waging in Byzantium, a debate that dealt with the very issue of the hierarchy between word and image. After receiving the poorly translated notes of the Second Council of Nicaea, which had reinstated the use of images, the Carolingians articulated their own middle position on religious art. In his Opi Corolli Regis Contra Synodum, Theodulf of Orléans echoed Gregory the Great's decree that images should be neither worshipped nor destroyed, and also argued for the superiority of text over images. Quote, painters are thus able to commit events to the memory, but things which are perceptible only to the mind and expressible only in words cannot be grasped and shown by painters but by writers. <coughs> Although the Carolingians did commission many new artworks, and of course you've heard of the Carolingian Renaissance, um, in general these works were consistent actually with an aniconic agenda communicated in the iconographic choices themselves. So Theodore's choice to do the Ark of the Covenant today is an aniconic. Furthermore, Carolingian theologians firmly maintained the primacy of the written word over the painted image. In the sixth century, the scribe, the draftsman, and the colorist of the Ashburn and Pentateuch had coordinated their efforts to produce the manuscript. But even so, inconsistencies between some of the inscriptions and illustrations already demonstrated a tension between word and image, in which images were controlled or justified by text while at the same time being tasked with the heavier lifting of spiritual and allegorical interpretation. This tension was furthered in the 9th century erasures and overpainting of the Ashburn and Pentateuch's creation image, which were executed in a political and theological climate characterized by its efforts at reform and regulation, skepticism about religious images, and emphasis on the unity and equality of the persons of the Trinity. When considered alongside the existing inscriptions, this overpainting reveals not only a preference for the written word, but also a creative and iconic solution to the problem of imaging the divine. <coughs> 